So anyway, 1 Samuel chapter 21. We're going to take a look at chapter 21, 22, and 23. And basically what you have during these three chapters is now the division this that we looked at at the end of chapter 20. Uh, concluding there, if you look at the end of chapter 20 with verse 42, you know, it was that famous Sunday school story where Jonathan and David, David is out hiding in the tall grass and Jonathan takes and shoots his arrow to give a sign that things aren't going well, that there is not going to be peace. And we concluded chapter 21, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me, between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to town. I will readily admit, and this is just another example of why it's always good for us to just keep rereading these accounts. Uh, if you had asked me a little while ago before this, uh, do Jonathan and David have any interaction after this? I would have thought, no, I don't think so. But tonight we read once again that they do. And again, it's, it's really amazing since we're really, Jonathan and David coming together as such close friends, and Jonathan uh, really swearing his allegiance to David. And all that going on while basically Jonathan's father, Saul, is in pursuit. But he didn't come here to listen to me. He came here to hear God's word and to talk about it and to take it to heart. So let's jump in. Chapter 21. Oh, before I forget that, uh, Don, you had uh, you gave me some information. Um, we were talking beforehand. We talked about Goliath being nine foot tall, mm -hmm. and and you looked up some statistics. Who yeah, was, Andre the Giant was seven four. Andre the Giant was seven four. And, and Keo, the guy that jaws in in the double uh, seven. Yeah, he, he just seven. passed away recently. Yeah, yeah. He was seven two. I don't know how big, how heavy Andre the Giant was. But yeah, he wasn't wasn't very heavy. Yeah. He would. Yeah. But I mean, we look at them and we call them giants and they're, you know, look at them and look at them as being huge. 7 2 and with, you know, the best translation of the terms being used back then, Goliath being 9 foot. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's mind boggling. I worked with two guys several years ago that were 6 8. Yeah. They had a dip to get him into the door. Yeah. Yeah. That was, they were big. Yeah. All right, chapter 21. David went to Nob to Abimelech the priest. Abimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Abimelech the priest, The king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, No one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet you at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever you can find. Just kind of note something here. Uh, David is to be respected and so on, but uh, how, do you, uh, how do you judge David's answer when Abimelech, the priest, and a if you have the handouts, or you can look it up as well, uh, on the second page of the handouts, you can see the, the line of the priests from Aaron, and it, it, it flip-flops back and forth between the two sons of Aaron, Eliezer and Ithamar, on the second page of the handout, and you can see how it's, it's down there. So you've got um, you've got you've got the priest there. But anyway, he shows up, and what, what, first of all, why do you think the priest might be afraid that David was there? It says, Abimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Again, there's no right or wrong answers. There's a lot of possibilities. He knew Saul was chasing David. You know, Saul and David weren't friends. He knew that. And was he maybe afraid? It's possible. He helped David out that he'd get in trouble with Saul. Yeah, I mean, that's a possibility. What's going on? This is really weird for you to be here alone. Um, that's definitely one possibility. Uh, again, the, 
the extent, and that's really what we're going to be seeing tonight in the chapters that we look at, the division between David and Saul has, has been very much kept in the court, and even Jonathan wasn't believing it up until this. And so the extent of it, it's, it's sort of like, and again, just so realistic to life even to this day. Everything starts out with kind of rumors and mumblings and stuff before it gets really public and so on. And sometimes you don't know what to believe. What practical reason, why, what practical reason did David turn to the high priest? For what practical reason? Oh, food. <laughs> yeah, he was on the run. Hey, Lanny. I'm sorry. No problem. Chapter 21, the handouts are, oh, when you get there, fine. I've noticed that it says, give me five loaves of bread. Isn't it when Jesus feeds the 5,000, there are five loaves of bread? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm glad jumped, you pointed that out. just totally jumped at me. <laughs> yeah. Of course, he wasn't, and again, this also shows his desperation, or whatever you have. Again, he was on the run, he was hungry, and he was turning for help. But again, even though, I don't know, it breaks my heart to think that David was lying, but he didn't tell the truth. He made it sound like he was on a mission for Saul. And, you know, I mean, again, the people of the Bible, you don't look at examples in the Bible for doctrine. You look at what God clearly says is right and wrong. Handouts are over on the kitchen counter. Oh. So anyway, he's obviously hungry. He's looking there. Verse 4, But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there are some consecrated bread here, provided that the men have kept themselves from women. So again, David does not seem to be totally alone. It must be a small entourage, which then would also fit in with the five loaves. But again, Abimelech says, or Ahimelech, sorry, misspoke myself. Ahimelech, you know, why are you alone? David had been a commander in chief, had been a general, had been, you know, for him to show up with five men would be, in essence, being alone. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's things or men's bodies are holy even on, on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread since there was no bread except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. So he did, he didn't have any bread, so he took the show bread, and Jesus does refer to this, um, I scribbled it down here, or noted it, in Matthew 12, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about how God desires mercy, not sacrifice, desires people to... Uh, Love their neighbor is the greatest command, even at the expense of breaking the ceremonial laws, which, and then he actually references and praises Ahimelech for feeding David with the showbread. But notice, what did Ahimelech do with, um, after he had given the bread to David and his men? He replaced it. And he replaced it with fresh bread on the very same day. Is that good? Or, I mean, how, do, how do you consecrate bread? Well, consecrate really is kind of a synonym for holy, literally set aside. I mean, you consecrate it by making it according to the regulations and then by placing it in front of the Lord, dedicating it. Mm -hmm. Really, again, how do you consecrate, what makes, you know, our offerings, we consecrate it, if we're, whether we're doing it in a budget or whether we make a decision a week by week or month by month, when we take a portion of our, our, of our wealth and say, I'm going to use this for good, I'm going to use this to praise the Lord, whether supporting Messiah or Tim or some other ministry or even, you know, doing something good for your neighbor, you're consecrating it, you're setting it aside. And that's really the core meaning of holy. Now the intrigue continues, though. Verse 7. And there's going to be a phrase here that's in the King James, it's in the NIV, and it's, it's in all the other translations. 
And it's a good translation, but I still wrestle with what exactly it means. In verse 7 it says, Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite. Again, Edomites are descendants of... No, good guess. Going all the way back to Esau. Yeah, Esau, also known as Edom. And again, I always talk about this. King Herod in the New Testament also referred to as an Edomian, spelled with an I and so on. But that's all part of it. So you've got this Doeg who is a descendant of Esau, not an Israelite. He's Saul's head shepherd. He's there. The point I want to point out says he was detained before the Lord. And when I went through in the English, that struck me as odd, so I went back and looked at the Hebrew, and I looked at other translations. The King James is one, and uh, Young's literal translation, which is a little bit maybe about that same time. And they all translate it detained, and it means to be held in place. And it literally says to be held in place or detained uh, before the Lord or in the presence of the Lord. I don't know if he was there on some mission, if that means he had some obligation, but it doesn't really, it doesn't affect the account, but it's just, it struck me as an odd turn of a phrase, in English and in the Hebrew. It doesn't tell us specifically what he was doing, it's just, he had business there, maybe is just the, uh, he, you know, he had to be there. Verse 8, David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. He's maintaining the story. He's trying to explain, in many ways, his ill-prepared state. Again, kind of getting to that surprise that Himelech expressed. Well, why are you here, David? You've got this small entourage. In essence, you're alone. And then this brings out, he didn't, he wasn't, dressed up for battle, he was just, he didn't have any weapons and so on, and he makes the excuse. Verse 9, the priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you kill in the valley of Elah is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. And so now when the, the division becomes more concrete, Saul has basically made it clear that he is going to be against David. David now is officially on the run, and he ran and he was very much alone, had no weapons, had to beg for bread. And there, though, he gets the sword of Goliath. Now, other than just actually having a sword, here's another thought question or just something to chew on. Why do you think getting the sword of Goliath at this time would be sort of a shot in the arm, a boost to the spirits, a confidence builder? Reminder of his accomplishments? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and his accomplishments slash how the Lord has taken care of him. It's like, and again, it, that's so real when it comes to our everyday life. Um, and that's, that's why it's not all bad when we, we don't want to turn relics or, or mementos into things that we worship or use it superstitiously. But there is nothing wrong with cherishing a grandparent's Bible or holding on to a cross that was given to you, say, at your confirmation or, or something, or your, even your baptismal certificate or or things like that. Um, it's just sort of, it, it, it's okay if it connects you to and reminds you of what the Lord has done. So, there we are. David is on the run, and he is alone, and basically, for lack of a better term, uh, the division is now becoming very public. And the pattern continues. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Again, Achish, king of Gath, is one of the Philistines, one of the peoples that were not driven out despite what the Lord commanded. 
But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now they're confused, but notice, what do they call David here? Yeah. And what do they reference? And what do they reference? Now, I think this gives us some insight into just how big a deal it was when we read before that Saul was bothered by that song. Because I think there was, and now here you're in the neighbors, you know, you want to you know what's going on in your home, talk to your neighbors, you know, or <laughs> they're, they're looking and they're going, isn't this David the king? They're already assuming that this guy is going to be king. Because the Israelites are praising him with this song. And to me, that just that, that emphasizes again why Saul would be so disturbed. Using the picture from Daniel, the writing just seems to have been, if he wasn't going to listen to Samuel, and he wasn't going to listen to the Lord through Samuel, the writing was on the wall in the trends of current events. And you can almost imagine the, 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 in the royal court, in the court of Gath, next door to Israel, so to speak, or next door to, to, yeah, to Israel, people talking and going, is Saul really still king? This David seems to be the guy. And so now David shows up rather alone. I mean, he's got a small group, but maybe just a handful. He's got the sword of Goliath. But... It, <clears throat> Wouldn't that king kind of look askant at David? What's that? Wouldn't that king kind of look askant at David, knowing that he was the one that killed with Goliath, especially since he had got the sword? Yep. Askance in what way? Just expand on that just a little bit. It, what? it, it would seem to me that, well, I've got David on my, my own prison him now. Let's just keep reading, because that's exactly what, that's the two and two David put together to get four. It says, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. David saw that his reputation had preceded him, and, and just like you spelled out, Don, that's exactly what they, he was thinking. His solution? So he pretended to be insane in their presence. While he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the door of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, Look at the man. He is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring me this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? Was... was if a person was insane, were they kind of taboo? You didn't do anything with them? Yeah. Plus, just, it's not someone that you would, I mean, look how he's being described, you know, just going around, you know, regardless of how they felt as a society, it's not someone that the king's looking upon as a threat. Because, again, the reference, what would it, if, if what would be, and again, we've got to remember how kings imprison kings. What would be the political advantage for Gath, for the king of Gath, for Achish, the king of Gath, to have David in his house, under his thumb and under his control? What political advantage could he take advantage of? That seems to me like it would be a big coup. Yeah. Because the people of Israel People of Israel seem to be respecting this David more than Saul. Now, if I get David in my house or I keep him under my control and I tell him, I basically make him a puppet, I can actually maybe go and take over the land of the Israelites. And again, this is so 20th century, 2019th century, 18th century, 16, just go back and back and back, puppet regimes and, and all these things. So David not only was protecting his life with this, you know, insanity thing, but also you could argue that he was protecting the people of Israel. 
because he was not going to be used as a pawn. So there was the physical threat and there was the political threat. Um, let's take a look, let's put a bookmarker there at, chapter, at the end of chapter 21. I'd invite you to open to Psalm 34. This is, again, a, a different situation, but uh, you, you've, got the same, you've got the same situation, uh, even though Akash here is referred to as Abimelech, you've got different names, but you've got the same situation being mentioned. And the notes in my study Bible, and this is, this is typical, um, note the king is referred to as Abimelech. Melech means king. Uh, Melech means king rather than Akesh. And the note says perhaps Abimelech was a traditional dynasty name or title for the Philistine kings. So again, but the, the in verse, I'm sorry, Psalm 34, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Now again, I'm going to pause. Remember, this is a, this is a psalm that's referenced that he is composing, perhaps in his mind and writing down later or whatever, um, committing to memory, but in put together as he is literally acting like a madman, trying to save his neck, perhaps trying to save the political connections. He is kicked out of his country. He's in a foreign king's country. He's being threatened with being taken into the king's court, and he has to protect himself by totally humiliating himself. The lions now grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Do you think at this time David might have been wrestling with the feelings of being brokenhearted? Do you feel as if he would be tempted to be crushed in spirit? Yeah. <clears throat> a righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. There you have also the messianic prophecy. Evil will slay the wicked, the foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants, no one who will be condemned who takes refuge in him. And talk about, there's a beautiful, I can't help but have my memory jog back to our Bible study on Revelation. And when the judgment day came and the books are open, the book of life, it's, or the book 
the books are opened with everybody's names written in and their deeds recorded. But then another book is opened, and it's the book of life. And it says everyone whose name is recorded in the book of life will not be condemned as they deserve, according to written down in the other books. And again, the Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. I'm trusting that my name is written in the book of life. I'm trusting in what Christ has done for me. Again, Psalm 34, in that reference of David in times when he is going through some difficulties. Questions, thoughts, comments, notes, anything you have to share? This says that uh, Ahimelech drove David away. Mm -hmm. Did he drive away? It just doesn't indicate where, that. Where is that? In which verse? On the top of Psalm 34. They said they're under the 34. Yeah, Psalm 34. Yeah. Of David, when he pretended to be insane to him, like before him, like we drove him away. Yeah, because again, that's going back to Samuel 21. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, his advisors were saying, we should take this David, we should keep him, and David acted insane, and Ahimelech get these guys mixed up, Abimelech, sorry, or otherwise known as Achish, it said there in verse 15, Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? Oh, Abimelech, I get Abimelech and Ahimelech. <laughs> yeah, Ahimelech is the priest. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, this is what's going on with David. You can appreciate the psalm. Let's jump into chapter 22. David left Gath, escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. Now again, if you're on the handouts, there's a number of references to David hiding in caves. This will not be the last time that David hides in a cave. And we'll look at some of those other ones uh, specifically when he deals more close with Saul, but once again, just take in what David is going through at this point. He was, first of all, in his father's household. Things were going well. Glorious championing, glorious champion taking over Goliath, defeating Goliath, brought into the king's court, talk, marries into the king's family, People in Israel are praising him. David, had, Saul has killed his thousands. David is tens of thousands. He's best friends with the king's son. And on top of all that, he's got that promise from the Lord through Samuel, you're going to be king. And now, he's had to basically act like a total idiot in public, so bad that they thought he was crazy. And now, he's in the middle of nowhere, hiding out in the cave. Again, talk about the temptation to feel, what's going on, Lord? How is this going to happen? And again, that phrase back in 34 towards the end of the psalm. Bad, I'm paraphrasing here, towards the end of the psalm. Bad things are going to happen to, to righteous people, but the Lord delivers. About how old is he here now? I missed last week, so. Well, David is basically, he's of mar marrying age. I, I don't know. We don't have an exact reference. Um, Still a young man. Though. Yeah, definitely a young man. I'm, I'm going to guess mid to late 20s, I'm guessing. And that really is a guess. Maybe some scholars have can put other pieces together and find something. But I, I don't have a, a good reference for you. But definitely a young man. But, but still a man and, and a mature enough that of course, you know, as a boy, a ruddy-faced boy, as he was described, took on Goliath. But now he's also being seriously considered a king. So, definitely a young man. Verse 2. Oh, sorry, in the middle of verse 1. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. One of the just 
notice, uh, and this is so typical, this is so real life, how did, get, how did David gather his 400 men? What were the connections that brought these people to David? How did David become a leader? Like Robin <laughs> Yeah, all joking aside, you, you've got a family connection, his father and brothers, who you would think, and you know, his father and his brothers, we don't really have a bad impression of them. They did give him a little bit of grief when he was talking so boldly about Goliath, but they know the promise from Samuel. They were there when he was anointed. His father's household heard about it. And again, when we're talking household, we're not just talking, we're talking extended family using our terms. You know, we're, we're, Israel is made up of tribes and clans and, and so on. And uh, again, Saul was from the Benjamites. David from Judah. So we're even talking more than just different households. We're talking different tribes. So David would naturally have more of this connection with the people who are in Judah. But he only had 400 here. And also look who else came, not just family members. Verse 2. Who gathered around him? The ones who were distressed and dead or discontent. Yeah. People who weren't happy with the way things were going. Now again, it's tough to know for sure, but the, the idea that they're in debt, there was the ability for Israelites to be in debt, but there was always that time of jubilee. There was always that time when the debt should be forgiven and so on. I don't know if it does make me wonder if this is perhaps an indication they were in debt, and not only were they in debt, but they were being in debt because the laws of the Lord weren't being followed by the leaders that surrounded themselves with Saul. I can't say that with certainty. I don't have anything to back that up. There is going to be another reference coming up in a little bit when Saul speaks to his leaders that might indicate that. But obviously people that were discontented. There's a huge probability because people are greedy. I'm yeah. going to give it, forgive that guy. He would be a dollar. Yeah. Yeah, even when the Lord commands it, and that's the way it's supposed to work. But he's got about 400 men. So we're not talking a huge army here, but we're talking a sizable group now, about 400 men. Verse 3. From there David went to Mitzvah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab. And they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. But the prophet Gad, and we hear, we always remember the prophet Nathan, and we remember the prophet Samuel when it comes to dealing with, uh, with David, but also the prophet Gad is one that the Lord regularly used. This is where he's being mentioned to speak with and advise and be a spokesman to David. Um, if you page quickly, if you want... Uh, to 1 Samuel 29.29, 29, if my memory serves me right. I can't be right, so what's wrong here? Let me take a quick look. I'm going from memory here. I didn't scribble it down. I should have. Oh, sorry, my mistake. First Chronicles, that's the problem, not Samuel. First Chronicles 29, 29. And First Chronicles deals with things as a parallel of Samuel and Kings. But First Chronicles ends with the death of David. Second Chronicles begins with, with Solomon and, and then, of course, the divided kingdom. But at the end, it simply says in First Chronicles 29, 29, as for the events of King David's reign from the beginning to the end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the records of Nathan the prophet, and the records of Gad the seer, together with the details of his reign and power and the circumstances that surrounded him and Israel and the kingdoms of all the other lands. So Samuel, Nathan are often remembered, but poor Gad is forgotten. Well, Gad's not going to be forgotten here. So he's just, again, 
introduction or a reminder of how the Lord uses many people. The important thing is what the Lord had to say. Verse 5, But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. One other small little nuance. Where did David, it's just again reviewing what it says, where did David take his parents, his mother and his father, where did he take them for safety, what country? Moab, that's way on the other side of the Dead Sea. Yeah. Who else went to Moab and who came from Moab? Ruth. Ruth. Who, I can always can't keep it straight in my head after all these years, but great, great, is it Ruth the Great? Grandmother of David, Ruth, or Bo, Ruth married Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David. I think I'm getting that correct. I'm doing it from memory. I should just go back and look at Ruth. Yes, it says, uh, yeah, Ruth and Boaz had Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Ruth was David's grandmother. There it is. I always get that mixed up. Why I can't get that stuck in my head? Years and years and years I've taught this, and I just can't keep it straight. So again, there's a familial connection there. Oh, let's go back. Let's take it. Again, I don't know. I'm just taking a little bit of information we have, but it would fit within the realm of common sense. Oh, let's go back. You know, David's got his royal connection because he's made a name for himself, but... Why Moab? I can't help but think there must be something with, well, that's where Grandma came from. It, 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 would, it would make sense to me. Uh, but he, and again, he stayed there, but notice again, and he was very comfortable there, but who prompted him to say, no, you, I don't want you staying in Moab. Mom and Dad can stay there, but I don't want you, David, in Moab. Ooh, the prophet. Yeah. And the prophet, speaking on behalf of? God. Yeah, the Lord. The Lord has plans for David. Yeah, it might be comfortable in Moab. You might feel physically protected in Moab. Logically, it makes sense to stay here. That's not what I want for you. I want you to get back to Judah. Yeah. When we were in Israel, um, we were you know, driving through parts of the back country or whatever, you know, and it's just desert, mountains, whatever. you know. And then they would point out, like, this is the area where David was hiding out, and it's just nothing. I mean, maybe a few trees along a creek or whatever, yeah. and that was it. I mean, yeah. Very <laughs> desolate. Fun. You can understand why somebody would hide out there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> probably hard to be found, but I mean, not like living in a king's palace. <laughs> no, most definitely. And again, that's you go back and you read those Psalms, as we're going to look again, or we're going to see again in the future. You know, Lord, I am you can just You can just imagine him crouched in one of those desolate caves, in the night, maybe a little fire, or maybe no fire because he's so afraid he might be seen, and just go, Lord, my hope is in you. I don't know how this is going to work out. I trust in you. And in my verse 3, it's interesting to me. He says, what God is going to do for me mm -hmm. instead of with me. Could that be in my translation? No, I think it's, you know, um, again, I have to go back and glance at the Hebrew, which preposition is being used, but, you know, what is the Lord going to do for me? How is he going to work this out? And, and I'll show I, again, I don't have the Hebrew in front of me, and I, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't take a look at that particular phrase. But to me, it was like, okay, I, not that what the Lord's going to do with me, how I'm going to, but what, how is the Lord going to work this out is how I took it. And he's, he's saying to Moab, hey, I, you know, I need mom and dad to be someplace safe, and I need someplace where I can just... And think about it, he's literally been on the run. And all the stuff that he's gone through, and even now he's got 400 men, but it's still not safe for him. And it's very, you know, realistically, he goes to Moab, his parents, you know, he's got... That's where Ruth came from. Um, and maybe it's a pause where he's just... Kept, a place where he could actually catch his breath and get a sleep at night without one eye open. And he goes, I need to stay here to find out, okay, i got to find out what the Lord has in store for me. Now the next verses continue to tell us what the Lord 
had in store for David and how it was going to be working out. <clears throat> Verse 6. And again, this is another situation where Saul, you just my heart just goes out to him where it's like, please, no, don't go, don't make things worse. Now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered. And Saul's spear in hand was seated under a tamarisk tree on a hill at Gibeah, with all his officials standing around him. Saul said to them, now listen to the anger in his voice, Listen, men of Benjamin. Again, notice his tribe, his leaders, his people. Will the son of Jesse give all of you fields and vineyards? Now here's what I was talking about before with people being in debt and discontented. Again, you can go fast forward into the future with Ahab, um, but how would it have been possible for Saul to give Benjamites fields and vineyards beyond what they already had been given during the allotment of the land at the time of Joshua? Where would those fields and vineyards had to have come from? Take them away from somebody else. Judah, probably. Yeah, taking them away from someone else. Which again, going against the laws of the Lord, the laws that have been set up about land, and, and, and so on. And you can think of the trick that, you know, Nabus Vineyard, this is the account of Nabus Vineyard. Fast forward a good amount of time with King Ahab and Jezebel and taking Nabus Vineyard. And that's why I put these two little pieces together when it talks about those in debt and discontented. And I see him say this to his leaders. He say, you want David to be in charge? Is he going to give you these things? Men of Benjamin, is he going to show you favors? Is he going to break the law for you? He probably wouldn't. He would have justified it. But Saul said to them, listen, men of Benjamin, will, will the son of Jesse give you fields and vineyards? Will he make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why you have all conspired against me? No one tells me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie and wait for me as he does today. Saul is just flying off the handle. He is just irate. And again, my heart goes out to him, not because he deserves mercy, but I, you know, I wouldn't wish the wrath of God upon my worst enemy. But now here, here we are introduced to this Edomite again. But Doeg, the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's official, said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Ahimelech, son of Ahitob of no, at, no, at Nob. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath the Philistine. At this Saul goes ballistic. Then the king sent for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitob, and his father's whole family, who were priests at Nob. And they all came to the king. Saul said, Listen now, son of Haitub. Yes, my lord, he answered. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of the Lord for him, so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me, as he does today? Ahimelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David? The king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard, and highly respected in your household. Was that day the first day I inquired of God for, for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. What do you think Ahimelech is referring to when he says, Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. What's he just simply, what's he tactfully bringing up? What's he tactfully, very 
subtly saying. This whole affair, what are you mad at David for? Why are you so irate? What's going on? There's no reason. I mean, yeah. He says David is uh, likes in wait for me. Well, no, it was the other way around. He was running away from him. Yeah. He's just imagining all that. Yep. And so Ahimelech really puts his life on the line. He speaks to the king like this. Of course, he is the high priest. Then, again, talking about digging the pit deeper. Verse 17, Then the king ordered the guards at his side, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because they have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me. But the king officials were not willing to raise a hand to strike the priest of the Lord. What do you think people are starting to say and starting to think and starting to feel in the court of Saul? I think they're starting to feel like Paul a little bit as a disagree, right? Yeah, this is wrong. Something's not right here. And that was that took guts. Imagine, this is the king, and he turns to the guards and says, "Kill the priests." And these guards refuse. That took guts. They said, this is wrong. This is not. And again, one of the footnotes, one of the cross-references, and it's a good comparison, uh, cross-referenced the uh, midwives in Egypt when Pharaoh told them, if a boy is born, kill him, but they disobeyed. And again, this is a great example where they said, no, this is, this is clearly wrong. We're going to disobey our, our human leaders because we're going to follow the Lord. Not always easy. But now the intrigue, the things just get messy. The king then ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priest. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That, kill, that day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put to sword Nob, the town of the priest with its men and women, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. But Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, escaped and fled to join David. He told David and Saul, he told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul. I am responsible for the death of your father's whole family. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who is seeking your life is seeking mine also. You will be safe with me. Let's take a second and put your bookmark there and turn to Psalm 52. Notice the title of Psalm 52. For the director of music, a Amaskil of David, when Doeg the Edomite had gone to Saul and told him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Again, the specific reference is just going there, but uh, this again deals with this whole account. Reading through Psalm 52, it's, not, it's only nine verses. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty man? Why do you boast all day long? You who are a disgrace in the eyes of God. Your tongue plots destruction, it is like a sharpened razor. You who practice deceit. You love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than speaking the truth. Selah which again is that seems to be a break. You love every harmful word, O you deceitful tongue. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. He will snatch you up and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. 
the righteous will see and fear. They will laugh at him, saying, Here now is the man who did not make God his stronghold, but trusted in his great wealth and grew strong by destroying others. But I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. I will praise you forever for what you have done. In your name I will hope, for your name is good. I will praise you in the presence of your saints. My question to you is, jumping back to verse 1, why do you boast of evil, you mighty man? Who's David talking about? Who could David be talking about? Seems to me that you're talking about Doeg. Could be. <clears throat> very well could be. It just it, you mighty man. Again, he was it doesn't sound very impressive, but in the context of the day, the head shepherd for the king. That's not a small position. He's there with the courts. Who else could it refer to? Who else could David be inspired to refer to? Maybe Saul. Yeah, maybe Saul. The bottom line is the description, and again, the historical context which we see, really, this is a great psalm. Psalm 52 is a great one. I can't help but think that some of the Christians around the world that right now are having their lives threatened, their homes uprooted, are being, are being chased around and being destroyed. Notice, again, talk about Revelation. David, as we are going to continue to see, did not personally attack Saul. He let the Lord work it out. But he did clearly, Saul, or here Doeg, or, but Doeg working at the command of Saul, so there's still that connection. But David says, but I'm going to trust in the Lord. These evil men are going to have their way. They are going to inflict injury. There is going to be destruction. There is going to be pain and suffering. But just because there's pain and suffering and destruction does not mean I will stop trusting in the Lord because when everything, and again, I can't help but think of the pictures in Revelation, you know, the saints, in that one chapter, we, it's recorded how the saints who have been martyred are crying out, the spirits of the saints who are martyred, cry out to the Lord, how long? And they want this vengeance. But it's going to be vengeance at the hand of the Lord. Again, that famous verse, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. But that's a psalm. Psalm 52 is a good one to remember when you read about persecution or, or when you feel it. And David, <clears throat> again, just... Just imagine the real emotions, the real raw emotions, getting the word about not just the priests were killed, their families, and the whole city, men, women, children, infants. Again, you can see Saul literally just going off the deep end. Chapter 23. Any questions, comments, insights? notes that you've written down from previous studies that you'd like to share. I certainly never object to that, and I do appreciate it. I wish I could say that chapter 23 was going to be a nice, cheerful chapter. Uh, no, it's kind of the same thing. When David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kyla. However, now there is a change. I, should, I spoke too soon. There is kind of an upbeat here. And are looting and threshing, are, and looting the threshing floors. He inquired of the Lord, saying, "Shall I go and attack these Philistines?" The Lord answered him, "Go attack the Philistines and save Kailah." But David's men said to him, "Here in Judah we are afraid. How much more then if we go to Kailah against the Philistine forces?" Hey, David. We're just trying to protect ourselves here in Judah from Saul. What are you doing thinking about going out and attacking the Philistines? Going out and rescuing this town? We've got a battle to fight here. What do you think about going out there? And again, I can't help but think of some of the fear of, well, we've got a lot to go and work on here at church. What's this idea of going out and getting more people and talking to them? Well, I don't want to make a direct connection, but it jogs the thought. Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, Go down to Kilah, for I am going to give the Philistines into your hands. 
So David and his men went to Kilah, fought the Philistines, and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Kilah. Now here's the note. Now Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had brought the ephod down with him when he fled to David at Kilah. The ephod was that breastplate that was, had the stones representing all the tribes of Israel that the priests were to wear in the presence of the Lord. And there's also this, this item, and again, we don't know a lot about it other than it exists in its basic use, and it's called the Uman and Thuman, <laughs> which always stuck in my head ever since I was a kid because it sounds so, the Uman and Thuman. But basically, these two items that were to be kept on the breastplate next to the heart of the priest, and it's referred to quite regularly of used to make decisions. And I don't know, I honestly, I don't know, I haven't studied it enough, but I do know clearly from Scripture that the high priest was to use this to help get decisions from the Lord. And maybe you can think of the apostles when they cast lots to decide who is going to replace Judas. Not that they use the ephod, I'm not saying that, but this idea of saying, all right, let's use something that from a human point of view looks totally like chance, but we're asking the Lord to direct us. And therefore, it's not chance, it's the Lord's will. And again, the, the, the uman and thuman and the ephod as the breastplate, those were not superstitious things, those were commanded by the Lord to be used by the priest in connecting with the Lord. So that's the reference there when it talks about a decision was when he, David inquired. It was through the priest, the high priest using this. Verse 7, oh by the way, what has now just changed in David's, with David's uh, situation? What has he gone from and what is he at, what is he becoming now? Went from being run away to an aggressor. Yeah. <laughs> A savior, and again, Don, all joking aside, there, there's a reason it's not it's not unique to like Robin Hood. These heroes, I mean, the, the the typical story of a hero, whether it's whether it's the ancient stories of of King Arthur or or any of them, and it's it's a common theme, and it comes from this because everybody loves. Well, let's face it, everybody loves the underdog, and here you have an underdog that the Lord is on his side, and now instead of being, he's gone from running away, begging for bread begging for weapons. He gets a small group of people around him. He still has to hide. He has to feign insanity to save his neck. He gets a respite in Moab, catches his breath. His parents are safe. The Lord directs him back to Israel. And now the Lord is saying, now I want you to start acting like the king. I want you to start being the king who the Lord uses to protect and to care for his people. And I don't think it's a stretch, we're not going to read it, but again, the idea of a king, worldly people think of a king as the guy who bosses us around. And remember what did Jesus say about to his disciples when they were arguing about who was going to be on his left and right? If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be a servant of all. And a king, really, the idea of the king and the picture of, and again, another famous psalm, 23rd psalm, a good shepherd. A shepherd is the king of his flock. But what does he do? Protect, feed, nurture, and help. David's now stepping into that role. All of a sudden I lost my spot. Where? Oh yeah, verse 7. Saul was told that David had gone into Kilah, and he said, God has handed him over to me. For David was imprisoned, has imprisoned himself by entering the town with gates and bars. So obviously this was a town, a fortified town. He had delivered it from the Philistines, but now this was his headquarters. And Saul thinks, aha, now I've got him. Because he's going to, now I can go down there and put a siege. And he's eventually, I've never known of a siege really to succeed. Verse 9, when David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod. David said, O Lord, of God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Kilah and destroy the city on account of me. Will the citizens of Kilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will. 
And David asked, Will the citizens of Kailas surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, They will. <laughs> Talk about encouragement or life lessons where trust in the Lord, don't trust in mankind. Lord, will these people hand me over? I just saved their necks. I just delivered them from the Philistines. They've been treating me like a hero. Lord, will they sell me out to Saul? Oh, yeah. <laughs> just give them an opportunity. <clears throat> so David and his men, about 600 in number, we've grown a bit, left Kyla and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Kyla, he did not go there. David stayed in the desert strongholds in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's, and here we are. No, here again, this is the one that I should have remembered, but I didn't. It struck me as I was reading through it again. While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned Saul, verse 16, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. I have no idea specifically what that means, other than it could mean encouragement, it could mean mutual prayer, it could, I don't know, but he helped him find strength in God. Again, talk about Jonathan's faithfulness. Verse 17, don't be afraid, he said, my father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Think about, compare Jonathan's attitude and Jonathan's way of looking at things compared to his father's. What was Jonathan willing to accept? Yeah, the Lord's will. He respected David as a person, but he also respected the Lord's will. And to say these things, and again, just it's mind-boggling of the, the intrigue and the politics and the mixed emotions and the feelings that must be going on. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. Once again, Saul, Jonathan says, and Dad knows this. But I just, again, the tragedy for Saul, he just keeps kicking. Again, that phrase that's used elsewhere in Scripture, why do you kick against the goads? Why are you so stubborn? You know it's not going to accomplish anything. It's going to inflict pain upon you, but you're so stubborn, you just keep doing it. That's Saul. And again, unfortunately, I can see those qualities in, in myself at times, my sinful flesh. Now, in King James, it says, I shall be, the 17, I shall be next unto you. Yeah. I mean, to me, it just, second place almost makes you wonder if he's got ulterior motives. You know, wanting to be... By your side, I think it's, I think it's somewhat similar, the concept of being by your side or translated in second place. Especially when you put it, you're going to be king, and I'm going to be with you yeah. by your side, but by your side. you're king, and I'll be there with you, but I acknowledge you as king. Uh, verse 19, the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horish on the hill of Hakilah, south of Jesh? Jesh Imon, now we know exactly where that is. Uh, sorry, I don't. We know in the general area. Maybe some great scholars got it all nailed down. I don't. Now, O king, come down whenever it pleases you to do so, and we will be responsible for handing him over to the king. Saul replied, The Lord bless you for your concern for me. Go off on a mini tangent. Saul is willingly using the name of the Lord. And that's, again, the Lord's name being taken in vain, false prophets, and can sound so sweet, sound so right, you've got to dig in and say, what's the will of the Lord? And I'll be honest with you, it's been quite a long time 
And it was, it's just not just with the current president. I can go back, you know, even, even presidents that I respect, but I know really haven't been faithful Christians, and they say, well, God bless America. And I hear that, and I cringe. Sure. And I say that because not any disrespect to the president. Obviously, I trust in the Lord to take care of our country. We only stand because of His will and His will alone. And we will fall if and when He desires. But you, people can say, God bless America all they want. If they're not talking about the true God or they're not with the true God, it means nothing. Many tangent sermon there, sorry. But uh, Saul replied, God bless you for your concern for me. Go and make further preparations. Find out where David usually goes and who has seen him there. They tell me he is very crafty. Find out about all the hiding places he uses and come back to me with definite information. Then I will go with you. If he is in the area, I will track him down among all the clans of Judah. So they set out and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the desert of Maon, in the Arabah, south of Jeshimon. The Arabah in the south, again, that kind of desolate area, even further south than Jerusalem and Bethlehem, that kind of vast desert area heading toward Egypt. And the Arabah is, is even the southern part of the Dead Sea and so on. When Saul heard this, he went into the desert of Maon in pursuit of David. Once again, so real life, so real, which is, again, it is history. Saul was going along one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side, hurrying to get away from Saul. Now I'm saying this to illustrate a point. Wasn't that lucky? No, this is the Lord. This is the Lord working things out. As Saul and his forces were closing in on David and his men, and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, Come quickly, the Philistines are raiding the land. And Saul, Saul broke off his pursuit of David and went to meet the Philistines. That's why they call the place Selah Hamalekoth. Translated down there, a rock of parting, a division. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. That last bit, why would the Philistines be attacking while Saul's going down into this desolate place in the south chasing after David? Why would, practically speaking, realistically speaking, why would the Philistines be attacking? Saul was busy. <laughs> yeah. Here, let's seize the opportunity. Saul's distracted. He's down there. Again, that's the practical human part of things, but again, you can see the Lord's hands. Let's wrap things up. Let's turn back to the psalm, Psalm 54. <clears throat> Trying to pick the highlights here. Psalm 54, only seven verses. It starts off, For the director of music with stringed instruments, a mosquito of David, when the Ziphites had gone to Saul and said, Is not David hiding among us? Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God, listen to the words of my mouth. Strangers are attacking me, ruthless men seek my life, men without regard for God. Surely God is my help, the Lord is the one who sustains me. Let evil recoil on those who slander me. In your faithfulness destroy them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from all my troubles. And my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. Again, so typical with the history. Now he can start talking about, I've looked with triumph on my foes more than just Goliath and those battles in the past. But even delivering, delivering the city from the Philistines. But he is still being hotly pursued. And now we can appreciate that psalm and remember the context and the history. Final announcement, other than the fact that we're 10 minutes over, um, I will not be here next Tuesday. We're just going to skip a Tuesday, and we'll pick up again when I get back. Uh, so not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after that will continue. As always, I strongly encourage you, feel free, 
I, I know I'm, I'm reading it to you. I figure with a smaller group, if you want to do it differently, if someone would like. But uh, we're just going to keep going through this and taking in the life of David. Chapter 24, you can see the heading. You can see things are getting real interesting. Um, we're just going to continue down that road. So not next week, but two weeks from now, we'll be online again and here in person. Let's close with a prayer, and if anybody wants to visit or talk about something, we can. Dear Lord in heaven, this evening as we've studied the life of David, once again we're reminded that just because we are anointed by you as David was, anointed with the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, just because we are heirs of a kingdom like David, an eternal kingdom that we have in Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that we won't have any problems in this world. It doesn't mean that the enemies of the Lord will not pursue us just as they hate and despise you. Dear Lord, we humbly ask that you would continue to protect us and care for us as you see fit. We place the vengeance and the punishment that they deserve in your hands. And we ask that you would simply sustain us continually with your promises that we look forward to rejoicing with you in glory everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.